There are many ways to discuss the organization of the brain. In this chapter, we will first situate the brain as part of the broader nervous system. Secondly, we will discuss one way of grouping brain structures into four primary areas that will be useful for this chapter and subsequent chapters. From the beginning, it's important to point out that the brain does not exist in a vacuum. This is often the way it comes across when you read articles or popular press or sometimes even textbooks. They can give the impression that the brain is doing certain things and leaves out the idea that's very important, which is the brain is part of a broader system, in this case, the nervous system. The nervous system can be grouped into two broad categories. The first is the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord. This central nervous system acts as a sort of command and control center for the body. In contrast, the second part of the nervous system is called the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system consists of a vast network of cranial and spinal nerves, and its functions to link the central nervous system with tissue and organs and other parts of the body. Our focus today is exclusively on the central nervous system, and in particular, the brain. As I mentioned earlier, there are many ways to discuss the organization of the brain. One common way that neuroscientists use is to group the brain into four broad areas. The brainstem, which is largely involved in automatic functions. The cerebellum, which is involved in, among other things, motor control, fine motor movement, balance, posture. The diencephalon, which primarily is involved in regulatory functions. And the cerebrum, which is involved in high level functions like language, thought, perception. In this chapter, we'll discuss the first three, the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the diencephalon. Let's begin with the brainstem, which is essentially where the spinal cord ends and the brain formally begins. Now the brainstem technically consists of several structures like the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. However, we'll talk about it as one unified structure here. The brainstem serves many functions, some of them vital, like regulating blood pressure, heart rate, and breathing. Now you can think about that for a moment. Of those three, breathing you do have some voluntary control over. So for example, until I brought it up, your brainstem was controlling your breathing. But now that I've mentioned it, you've had to exert some control over it. So your mind is consciously saying, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Now, Try as you might, you can't seem to force yourself to stop thinking about that breathing. It's kind of annoying, so you're welcome. But don't worry, as you get sucked back in and pay attention to me instead of your breathing, your brainstem will take over. It's probably a good thing that you don't have that kind of voluntary control over the other two, blood pressure and heart rate, because there's very little upside to being able to control, sort of slow down your heart rate, speed it up. But there is a lot of downside to say, forgetting to beat your heart. So, your brainstem takes care of that, gives you some control over breathing. In addition to those vital functions, the brainstem also regulates things like coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and overall arousal level, particularly as it relates to the sleep-wake cycle. That last piece, arousal level, you probably have some experience with, whether you realize it or not. Let me paint a picture for you. It's nighttime, you're laying down in bed, you're about to go to sleep. You feel your body relaxing, and then all of a sudden, you jerk, and it kind of scares you, and you wonder, is something wrong with me? Well, the short answer is probably, but it has nothing to do with this piece. This is a common occurrence, and it's called the hypnic jerk, and it comes about because of the brainstem. What it is is this. Part of going to sleep involves relaxing your muscles, and the brainstem deals with that. But it's not really a gradual sort of relaxing of the muscles. It's more like a light switch. And as the brainstem triggers that, it also perceives its own response, the muscle's response to going relaxed as you're falling. And it corrects itself by going rigid. Now that happens every night. It's just usually you're not aware of it because you're already sort of not conscious at that point. That is unless you've had too much caffeine or you're stressed out about something. Now, if you don't believe me, you can do an experiment. Tonight, why don't you watch a loved one or a neighbor, okay, not a neighbor, a loved one, watch them fall asleep. And you'll notice 
quite early on in that process, they'll show that jerk. And that's just a sign that they're going into sleep. But it's a common occurrence and it's part of brainstem function. The second structure, the cerebellum, lies directly behind the brainstem. Its name literally is Latin for little brain. And it is linked to the rest of the brain and the spinal cord with massive tracts that all run through the brainstem. The cerebellum is involved in many functions, including things like attention and language, but its primary role is in that of skeletal muscle control, specifically in fine motor control for things like balance, posture, and muscle tone. It's important to point out that although the cerebellum is heavily involved in movement and motor control, the cerebellum itself cannot generate those movements. Instead, its role is to calibrate and fine tune ongoing movements. The third structure, the diencephalon, also consists of several independent parts. However, unlike the brainstem, these parts play such wildly different roles in regulation that it's worth briefly touching on them independently. The first part of the diencephalon that we'll talk about is the pineal gland which is a very small gland located right at the center of the brain. Now I said it's small because it literally is about the size of a grain of rice, but it plays a very important role in several functions. Most importantly, it helps regulate the sleep-wake cycle by producing a substance called melatonin. You may or may not be familiar with melatonin if you've ever taken over-the-counter sleeping aids, things like that, but melatonin is released in response to darkness and it creates a cascading effect that triggers the sleep cycle. In contrast, when there's light outside, the production of melatonin in the pineal gland is inhibited. Now the word melatonin is somewhat misleading here, so it's worth briefly talking about how it got its name. It came about because an early focus in dermatology looked at the role of the pineal gland and the substance it was producing in terms of its role in skin pigmentation, and dermatologists thought it may have implications for a wide range of skin problems. Now subsequent research found that that wasn't the case. But what they did find is that that substance, still called melatonin, was involved in something very important, as we mentioned, the sleep-wake cycle. In addition to the pineal gland, the diencephalon also includes a small, very important structure called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is involved in many regulatory functions. Most importantly, it's heavily involved in the maintenance of homeostasis, which is a technical term for that dynamic balance between the organism and their environment. Now the hypothalamus is involved in homeostasis through the regulation of three functions, body temperature, water balance, and appetite. Let's begin with water balance. Now your brain is roughly 70% water, and recall that it's composed of neurons. And for those neurons to function, they have to be bathed in a very delicate solution of not just water, but sodium and other sorts of essential chemicals. And when that water balance gets off, either too much sodium, for example, or too little, bad things happen. So for neurons to function, they need that delicate range of chemicals in the water. And the hypothalamus is the primary regulator of that balance. It does so by regulating two different types of thirst, osmotic and hypovolemic. Now you've probably experienced both of these, but it's worth talking about them for a moment. So you will help clarify the times when you should reach for a glass of water and when you might wanna reach for that Diet Coke. The first kind of thirst, osmotic, is probably what you think of when you think of being thirsty. Here, what's happened is you've taken in too much sodium, probably from eating like salty foods, and you've changed that balance between water and the chemicals that the neurons are bathed in to the point where there's too much sodium outside of the neurons. And again, as I said, bad things can happen. In this case, the hypothalamus will trigger a strong craving for water and water only. In fact, when you've been thirsty like that, nothing else quite sounds right. You just want water. Now, the problem is sometimes you can have learned behaviors where you just reflexively kind of grab for a Diet Coke, but those kind of sodas have a lot of sodium. And in fact, you're just exacerbating the problems under those circumstances. So when your brain says, I want water, listen to it. The second kind of thirst, hypovolemic, is very different. This happens when you've lost a lot of body fluid overall. Not just water, 
but also that whole delicate solution. You've just lost it all, the sodium, the electrolytes, and such. This usually comes about from things like vomiting due to illness, uh, bleeding, or extreme dehydration. The thing here is that you don't just want to drink water, because think about what that would do. Say you've reduced your, that overall solution by half, you know, the, the glass is literally half full here. If you just fill it back up with water, all you've done is profoundly dilute the solution that the neurons need to function. And in fact, in extreme cases, they wouldn't function. What you need at this point is to take back in not only water, but those other essential chemicals like sodium and electrolytes. So in this case, you can imagine, like for example, if you've been sick and you've been vomiting, notice how water doesn't sound good at all. I mean, the thought of drinking water in that circumstance is just not appealing at all. Instead, your body craves the combination of salt and water, and often in the form of like a sports drink or a diet soda, things like that. In any case, with both types of thirst, your hypothalamus knows what it needs, and it's important for you to understand the distinction so you know what to reach for, whether it's water or Gatorade. In addition to the pineal gland and the hypothalamus, the diencephalon also includes a large egg-shaped structure called the thalamus. Now the thalamus is involved in several functions, but its primary role is regulating the flow of information to the cerebrum. Specifically, all sensory information coming into the brain, with the exception of smell, first is routed to the thalamus, processed, and then sent to the right areas of the cerebrum for further processing. So in this way, the thalamus serves as a gatekeeper for information to the rest of the cerebrum. Okay, to summarize. In this chapter, we situated the brain as part of a broader nervous system, emphasizing the fact that the brain does not exist in a vacuum. More specifically, we discussed a way of grouping brain structures that's common in neuroscience, separating them into four broad parts. Specifically, we focused on three, the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the diencephalon. The next chapter will introduce the fourth part, the cerebrum.